Amazon or uh, movies, stuff like that. But it's still not as good as it needs to be, and that's a really great screen, right? That's an Ultra HD screen, it's better than 1080p, right? So, for me, using that was really enlightening because it made me feel like, oh god, VR needs like 4K or 8K, really, to be to really deliver that sense of presence in a realistic sense. Not necessarily in a game world, but in a movie world. Right? Well, like if you're trying to make something that's photo, photo real. Right, to, exactly. To simulate the real world, we obviously have a long way to go. Whereas I think like, I mean, what are these TVs? These are probably 1080p. I can't say 80 pixels on them, because there's a little screen. Sure. Um, for VR, it's so, so much more demanding. And, and here VR, are become more apparent because you don't notice the resolution limitations as much when you're using rendered content. But when you start taking movies and films and things that you're used to seeing with extremely high fidelity, you can definitely see the limitations in front of the other sports. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone disagrees with me. We're going to need to get up to you know, 8K per eye or so before we start seeing diminishing returns. And I can tell you that even at 4K, we're not going to we're not going to be there. And so that to me seems like. 10 years away, right? Like 8K phones? I, I I know that phones move at a breakneck speed, but at the same time, like Ultra HD phones still are pretty new and still pretty expensive. You're right, and phones are, don't necessarily have that drive to advance much further. They're already at the limits. And that's why we're kind of at this weird intersection where the current rate of virtual reality, I guess, the explosion of virtual reality that's happening happened at a time when mobile phones brought high resolutions into into the mainstream of these little displays. But it's also it is also isn't going to go much further without something to push it. If, for example, you can imagine Gear VR. There could be a phone that was optimized not for being a phone, but for being used for Gear VR. And they're like, there's no point in having an 8K phone. There, it just really isn't. But it could be that those kinds of displays do get pushed for VR. Um, I guess the key is you're right. There's nothing in phones pushing displays to 8K or 16K. Virtual reality as an industry is going to need to push displays on its own and not just piggyback off the scraps of the mobile phone industry if it needs to get where it needs to go. Okay, so that aside, my next big grief was field of view. Uh, field of view on human beings is about 180 degrees or so. It's 270 degrees with eye rotation. Okay, well there you go. So if you're uh, straight ahead, direct, in front of you, 180 degrees, right? If you're Roughly, this yeah. way, right? You're up, that's about right. So, uh, the, the highest we have with any VR headset is about 100 degrees field of view, right? Yeah, it's a tricky question. It's negligible, maybe up to 120, there, something like that? There are headsets out there, but mostly professional headsets that go out to 120, 30, 40, 150. The trick is how you define field of view. I mean, the rift is almost 100% overlap. That is, you have almost the entire view in each eye. The further out your field of view goes, uh, like for example, if I hold my hand out here, I can't see it at all with my left eye. I can only see it with my right eye. Right. If I'm going to start going beyond 100 degrees, you need to start having partial overlap between the displays. And a common trick, especially with professional head-mounted displays, has been to reduce the overlap between displays so that you have like 50% on, for only 50% of it is stereo and the rest is just out to the sides. Um, I guess what I'm saying is it's pretty easy to make a headset that pushes that field of view number out, it's hard to actually make one that does it and still maintains good stereo overlap. It's it's a really tough challenge. We're, we're kind of at the limits of what modern optical technology can do. I'd say, you know, a little over 100 degrees is very achievable, but getting out to, let's say, 180 is it's a very, very difficult challenge. I think that, that concept of peripheral vision is really what I'm trying to get at, right? Like, that's the really the hardest thing is, especially using those kind of experiential virtual tourism things, when you want to, like, look to your left like this. I mean, I don't know if this is coming across on camera, but kind of, like, looking to my left or looking to my right. And even right now, while I'm talking to you, I can see some of the audience in my peripheral vision, although they're not perfectly clear. Well, it's even more than that, too. Immersion, right? Like, and it's really important. Like, like, when you're driving, you're able to sense peripheral, like, for actually, sure. actually, like your sense of motion from things coming towards you is actually pretty bad because it's, you know, it's moving fairly slow as it comes directly towards you. It's when it goes by you that it's actually right. pretty measurable. Um, I mean, I, I don't think anyone in the VR enthusiast community disagrees with you. We all want higher rights. Right, 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 right. We all want higher field of view. They're both really tough challenges and we're not going to fix it right away. Sure. I wish I could tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, we got that in the bag. I, I guess what I mean is not, you know, when are you going to fix this? More, 
how does this stuff get fixed, right? To me, is it like a, a, a massive curved screen that goes to here, right? Like, I don't know what it would be. Well, I, You're the one who's, who does well, this well, stuff. I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> sure. There, one common idea is that people have gotten from sci-fi is that there can be some kind of VR device where it projects into your retina and from a single point it creates a wide field of view. Sure. That, that isn't really practical. You can't project a field of view that's wider than the final optical element. So if you want to be have image over here, you're going to need an optical element that is over here. And sure. it's going to need to wrap around to, to do that properly. And you can't just make the lenses bigger and bigger. I mean, you can make them bigger and you know get a wide field of view. But imagine how big lenses would need to be to have a 180 degree field of view if they were flat lenses. Like It would have to be a pretty big lens, right? It, it'd have to be an enormously large lens. Uh, it, Actually, speak to lenses. I, I went and saw a, another VR headset last night that I thought did a really great job of handling uh, distortion around the edges, right? Uh, and they solved it by using a dual lens setup. And I, I, I'd love to hear your take on that because it, it worked really well, honestly, and it was something that is very different than what I've experienced with Oculus Rift, right? right? Um, so, yeah. There are other ways to do that without necessarily going to multiple lenses. Like software there's, and stuff, right? I mean, there are other lens technologies. Ah, okay. Uh, there's other hardware lens technologies. You can correct for a lot of software. Um, it's really a trade-off of cost and weight and how much distortion you want to be able to manage in software. Also, a field of view. Uh, the, the, more lens, the more elements you have in the lens system, the harder it is to get a wide field of view. Like, if, if, if you're talking about the lens system that I think you're talking about, it's significantly narrower field of view than Crescent Bay or DK1 or DK2. Uh, and that's just, that's kind of necessary. The more lenses you stack, the smaller your field of view is going to get. Because if you want to have a very wide field of view with multiple lenses, each of those lenses in the entire stack needs to be, needs to be quite a bit wider. Hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, so, speaking of Crescent Bay and uh, the future of PC-based virtual reality, uh, this is, you guys have said, clo a lot closer to what you guys want for a final consumer version. I know that you're probably, I, I don't know that you're speaking at all about what the consumer version will be. But uh, in terms of expectations, right, there's certain things that I know after using Gear VR for me, I expect path through on every VR headset that I'm going to use going forward. Uh, is that something that you guys think is, is really necessary? Something like spatial audio, obviously, you feel like is necessary. I, I, I mean, this is getting closer to representing the final version, right? So are there other bells and whistles that need to be there, I guess, still? A lot of those bells and whistles, the things that you can call bells and whistles are necessities. We know they're good, but you don't necessarily need everything. I mean, like, pass-through is a good feature to have. I wouldn't say it's critical to a good VR headset. A good VR headset needs to do a good job of being a VR headset. By the way, this isn't me saying we won't have it. I'm just sure. Saying, I don't consider that a critical feature. I mean, like, if you had a, if you had a perfect Matrix-quality VR headset that didn't have pass-through, I'd still say it's a good VR headset. Yes, fair enough. It, it, it may have shortcomings as a consumer electronics device from the mainstream, but... Um, if you have wide field of view, high enough resolution, low latency, uh, if you can knock, you know, lock those critical things and make it a good VR headset, I think that's what's really important. Uh, but there's other clear things, like, I think more important than something like pass-through would be having input solutions that are also optimized right. for virtual reality. Because what we have right now is a device that allows you to look inside of a virtual world in a way similar to how you interact with the real world. We don't have any kind of tool that allows you to interact with the virtual world in a way you interact with the real world. Things like Connect are interesting, you know, where you're reaching out, waving your arms. But I do a lot of things in the real world besides just moving my hands around. Sure. Uh, you know, I actually, I pick up things and it's, but and to do those things, you need a lot more than just moving through free air. Yes. Uh, I'm not saying that we have the solution to the problem, but I'd say that's, definitely something that's going to be critical for the future of virtual reality is to not just have the visual side, but have the visuals and the audio side and the input side. Um, and eventually, of course, you want to be stimulating like, movement through 3D space. You want to be stimulating your vestibular system as well. So that's specifically interesting to me in terms of an input method because you guys just bought this company, Nimble VR. I went and checked out their camera, I don't know, three months ago, four months ago. It's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good, right? And it allows you to put your hands into the world a little bit, and it allows you to enable some form of pass-through to an extent, and it easily connects. And presumably you guys saw some of the promise there as well when you were buying that. I can't talk specifically about any ongoing acquisitions, but I can say... Is that it an ongoing acquisition? I don't know. I'm I mean, just, that's just a nuts and bolts question. Every, everything is a process. Okay, fair enough. If, if it's announced, it's... It's good. Fair enough. Um, okay. But the, the right way to do pass-through really isn't to take 
with like for years, one of the fundamental problems with 3D technology and 3D video has been that it's relying on a trick in our brain. What we're doing is we're taking one image with the right camera, one image with the left camera, and then just passing those images through to our eyes without any kind of intelligence in between. And then our brain does all the hard work of building that into a 3D image. Right. The problem is, those cameras are unlikely to be at the right, like, it, unless they record at the right interpupillary distance, the right distance between eyes, it, the scale's gonna be off for anybody who watches that 3D recording who isn't exactly the right ID. And then if you put cameras on the front of a headset, think about this, we're used to rotating our heads and our cameras, our eyes, are actually recessed inside our skulls. If you put those cameras out here, when you're turning, they're not actually rotating, they're actually moving through space. Right. Which can make a lot of people feel ill really quickly. Sure. Um, I think that virtual reality is really, it shows how 3D falls apart at the scenes. The only way to really do it correctly would be to have some kind of intelligence and understanding of the world where you're able to record the world, you know, as a, as a 3D, as a 3D, object of depth and then reproject virtual cameras into that and then pipe that back to the eyes. That's really the only way you can make this work for anybody. And then you have accurate eye rotation, you have accurate IPD, you have and it's all you can calibrate it all in real time per user. Uh, it's gonna be a long time to look at there. I'm not saying that we're gonna do that right away, but like that's something that you may have seen in their demo for pass through. It was not just two cameras taking, you know, piping into each eye. Right. There was a depth camera and another camera laying the real world onto a depth map right, of that exactly world. That. And you can calibrate the IPD, the rotation of your eyes. The, the virtual eyes is exactly where your own eyes are. Uh, that's a much better way to do things. I, it, it wasn't a perfect representation. Oh no, it, it was, it was it enough probably, I could it was, take a drink of water so I could do human things. And right? that's the thing, traditional 3D recording, the reason it's so polished and looks so good at first glance is because it's such a simple trick. It's just normal video recording with one image to each eye. When you're trying to actually understand the world and build a depth map of it, you're gonna have a much harder time doing it correctly. So what you saw was probably broken and janky. Like, let's be honest, it was broken and it janky. It wasn't great, right? yeah. It wasn't and it was great. enough to do you know, some stuff. But at least the technology is fundamentally going in the right direction. And in the long run, it's not gonna be janky and broken. It's going to actually be by far the best way to capture the world and reproject it into a virtual space. It also means that you're not just Oh, I'm taking the real world and two feet to my eyes. You can actually understand that this is a separate object in the real world, and you can actually do all kinds of cool, cool things with it. Okay, so we've got one minute left here. I've got the last question is the same question I finish literally every interview. With. Let's just end it now. Uh, Let's just send it now. What's your favorite food? No, when is the Oculus Rift coming out? When can people buy this? We don't have anything to announce at this time. I'd say that you know, we're, we're working as fast as we can. We want to release this thing. I know it seems all, some people, they say, oh, it's vaporware. But remember, we have, we were talking about this earlier, we have not even been around for three years. We've been around for uh, two and a half years, and we released two products. First, we released one, pro DK1, then we released DK2. This is gonna be our third year in business. What about Gear VR? Well, I mean, Gear, I, well, then that three makes products. my point even better. Three products <laughs> in three years. Go. Uh, but I mean, really, that's Samsung's product that we worked on them with. So it's not fair for uh, me to take credit for you know launching that. But think, you know, we've been around for two years. We launched two products. We're going to be around for three years. So we'll see okay. what happens. All right. Well, we're all looking forward to it. Thank you very much for joining us today, Palmer. We'll be up. Uh, we'll, we're coming up next with an editor's choice piece. It'll be me again, actually. So stick around, and you can hear me talk about nonsense. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching.